All right. Hi, every day, buddy. Welcome to today's Cosmic Conversation. I'm very excited for our special event today because we actually have two guests, my colleagues, Mary Dussault, Dr. Pat Udompresser, who are both here at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. And they're going to share with us a couple really fun and exciting resources to help engage and get excited for the upcoming eclipse this spring. Um, and opportunities to think about how you might work with your audiences before, during, and after, uh, and then start some conversations. And I'm going to let the two of them introduce themselves and what they're here to share with us today. Um, Mary, you want to go first? Well, I actually think Pat should go first since her resource is what you want to use before the eclipse. And the one I'm going to talk about much. Well, Might quick be introductions of hello first, and then- Oh, hello. Well, I'm Mary. <laughs> hello. <laughs> I, uh, and I um, lead a fabulous team of educators here at uh, in the science education department um, uh, who mostly do all the work, but I try to think about uh, how people learn and how to- um, and based on how people learn how to design science learning experiences that are fun, engaging, and motivate people. And one of my projects is Micro Observatory, the, uh, a robotic telescope network. And that's what I'm gonna talk with you about today. Pat? I'm Pat Udon Prasert. Um, my background is that I was, um, I have a PhD in astronomy. I became a high school teacher for about five years after I got my degree. Um, and then I joined the CFA uh, about 15 years ago to um, create resources for education in astronomy. Um, I'm the science PI for a NASA science activation project called Cosmic Data Stories. Um, and we're building online resources that allow um, the public to engage with NASA-based imagery and other types of data. And um, awesome. I, yeah. Yeah, so Pat, maybe you wanna start us off by showing us the most exciting currently at the moment data story all about the eclipse for this spring. Uh, okay, take it off sure. here. Uh, and here, I'm gonna put the link in the chat if you guys want to play along. Um, and let me do a screen share. Okay, so this is um, one of our cosmic data stories. And this one is for the April 8th upcoming total solar eclipse. And what we um, are doing here is we're giving users the opportunity to watch how the solar eclipse is going to appear from basically any location. Um, so the opening scene is in Nazas, Mexico in Durango. Um, and so Nazas is in the path of totality. So this map here, this red line um, with this kind of grayish um, boundary on either side shows you where um, what parts of North America are going to be experiencing totality. And Nazis is the location where totality will last for the longest. And so you can kind of watch it happening. It starts out like a hundred times faster than real time. So you can actually see things happening. As we get close, it's gonna slow down so you don't miss totality. Um, and it gives a view of how when the moon completely covers um, the sun's uh, photosphere, then you see this bright, um, eerie, kind of wispy um, part of the sun called the corona. And the corona is really hot and it's really bright, but it's not as bright as the part of the sun that we normally see, the photosphere. So you can only see the corona when the moon is blocking the photosphere. And um, so this kind of gives you a sense of how the moon moves in front of the sky. Um, you can put on a grid of like which directions you're looking at. So this is, we're looking 
uh, oh, I shouldn't do that while I'm moving. Um, so here's, ooh, sorry. That's okay. That is something I haven't seen before. I'll need to check with our software team about what is that doing. Um, but you can scrub through time and, um, and the part that I enjoy seeing, which doesn't seem to be working right now, is how the sun and moon are actually moving together, like rising and setting together. Um, but I guess we're gonna need to fix that. Um, yeah, okay. So this is east. Uh, so maybe that was okay. It just wasn't working while it was all moving together, but you can see them rising and then they kind of come together and then they pass by each other and then they're setting. Hmm. And so you can go to any part of the country. So if I go here to um, some place in Kentucky, this is Moorhead, Kentucky, um, I can see how, uh, let me go back to the beginning. Um, if I zoom in a bit, center of the sun, so Moorhead, Kentucky is outside the path of totality. And so the moon is going to approach the sun and it's gonna cover a lot of the sun because it's close to the path of totality, um, but it's gonna kind of miss. So people in Moorhead, Kentucky aren't going to see a complete eclipse and so this is called a partial eclipse. So you don't get to see the corona from here, but it'll still be pretty cool. Um, and um, something that um, we think is a helpful feature for um, event organizers at museums, for example, you can find your location. Um, and then, so look, if I come to Cambridge, uh, let's see. Cambridge. And then I can do this share the view from a location. And this gives you a URL where it adds the latitude and longitude of the selected location. And then you can give that URL to your audience. And then when they come to the app, they'll see the view from the location that you've selected. So this um, will now display the eclipse from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, we have some cloud cover data. Um, this is from the NASA MODIS satellite. And um, so you can see that if you're in our original area in Durango, um, the median historical cloud cover data is pretty low. So what this means, this is going back about 20 years um, of data from this satellite. And on April 8th, you can see what the amount of cloud cover was um, for this particular location over these 20 years. So half of the years had a cloud cover value that was higher than 4% in um, this location in Mexico, and the other half of the 20 years had a lower cloud cover value. Um, so it is a little challenging that most through most of the path of totality, the cloud cover values historically are a little bit on the high side. Um, but my understanding, I'm not totally sure how this NASA um, MODIS satellite cloud cover quantity is calculated, but I don't think that 100% cloud cover means that you actually can't see any clear sky. Like I think there will be clouds, but that there will be patches where you can see through. And if, um, you know, if your totality is several minutes that you should be able to get to a place where you can see the eclipse. Um, there's this little book that gives you more information so you can read about what's the difference between a total or an annular, what causes the eclipse. There's this little diagram that shows you what is happening. Um, 
we have a learning guide that we've put together for educators um, that mostly this just links to a guided exploration. So you can go to this link and then you can use this button to copy the Google form as a template and then you can edit them as you like and give them to your audiences. You can print out a PDF of this guided exploration and it just gives the learner some tasks to go through when they um, open up this activity so that there's like concrete things for them to try and do um, with the resource. So I think I will stop there and hand off to Mary or if we want to do questions now, that's I can take questions now or later, however you want to do it. Why don't we hand off to Mary and then do all the questions at the end? Sure. Unless there's like a really burning question about the technical part of what Patches did. Yeah. No, I um I'll I'll just mention there was a version of the app for the October annular eclipse. And um it was great to use because I was in Maine where there was only there wasn't much covered, um, and it was a little cloudy. But it was great to use to predict where, you know, I'm putting on my glasses. I I could see, oh, okay, uh, when should I start looking that I'll be able to st start seeing that shadow? And then, uh, you know, it got cloudy, and I went in, and then and then and then I forgot, you know, which direction it was going. We would I still be able to see the shadow? And I was able to pull up the app and say, oh yes, let's look now, the sun's out and we should see it. And it was just like it, what was predicted in the app. So anyway, it was useful. Um, it was kind of fun to use even live. Anyway, all right. So I'm gonna talk about one of my favorite resources that were, that which is um, the Micro Observatory uh, Robotic Telescope Network. And, um, I'm going to um, kind of counsel you not to use this resource during the eclipse. If you have an if you have an opportunity to be at the eclipse, look at the sky instead. Um, uh, but we will be observing the eclipse from two of our telescopes. Um, one. Uh, that's uh, pictured here in Arizona, and one. Uh, Mary, I don't think you're showing us what you think you're showing us. I'm not. Why am I not? We're looking at the launch to the Zoom. Well, that's not what you should be looking at. <laughs> Let me try that again. That looks better. There we are. Yes. Okay. So we will be observing the eclipse from. Uh, Arizona, which is um, where two of our telescopes are, but only one will be um, watching live. And then also the other telescope that is currently on the roof in Cambridge, we are investigating the possibility of sending Frank, our telescope engineer, off to the path of totality with a micro observatory um, so that we can actually uh, observe, observe live. But in in any case, we would be observing it in Pat's um, in Pat's app. Let me get. Sorry, why am I not? We would be observing it from both uh, both north of the path of totality and from south of the path of totality. And you you can use Pat's app to predict what it is micro observatory should be able to see which is a way I have used the app as well. But um, one of the things uh, that uh, we do is observe every few minutes through the whole two to three hours of the eclipse, both before and after. And um, so there'll be a series of images of the eclipse and uh, you can access those I'm going to actually show you a tool that most people don't know about, 
um, in Micro Observatory and show you a tool that you can use to access those images. So um, if you go, if you just Google Micro Observatory, all one word, you it's the top, the top link. And if you, on the bottom here, go to this recent image directory, on the day of the eclipse, the most recently taken images will be right at the top. I was hoping to get up to the roof to take an image of the sun before this, before this, so that the top image would be the sun, but um, I didn't get there and now it's getting cloudy. Uh, but you can search in this directory, and this is a directory of the past 10, 20, or 30, I'm gonna do 30 days um, of all the images taken by Micro Observatory and it's searchable and sortable. So I'm gonna to go to the sun. There it is. And so now I have a list of just all the sun images that have been taken by Micro Observatory over the past 30 days. You'll notice there's lots of days missing because we only take sun images from the roof here in Massachusetts because that's the one image that there's a human in the loop for the Micro Observatory Robotic Telescopes. Somebody has to actually physically put a solar filter on the telescope so that it doesn't get damaged. And so each day the sun's out, we take an image of the sun. Um, I'll hopefully be doing it later today. Uh, and the, um, the images come up arranged by time, but there's these other characteristics of the image. And um, what you really want is images through the main camera. Here's, here's the last one taken through the main camera. And you can see a nice image of the sun. This is a naked eye sunspot that was on here two days ago. If I don't know if it's still on there, but if you have your solar eclipse glasses, you should look because the sunspot is so big, you can see it with just um, and those glasses. So you can download these images, but you can also create an animation using our JS9 image animation tool. And so um, I wanted to kind of show you the final, um, the final product of what you can do and then show you a, a, a tutorial for doing so. Um, so uh, I think I have it here, yes. All right, here we are. So back in October, the same was true. We took images both from, from Arizona and from Massachusetts and the ones in, was kind of cloudy in Massachusetts. So I downloaded a bunch of the images from um, Arizona. And then I put them in our JS9 image tool and I animated them. And I'm gonna show you the product here. Kind of cool. So you can do this yourself. You can do it. You can uh, 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 do a workshop where people create their own animations of the sun. They can um, they can colorize it. I didn't here. I just used the black and white. I didn't do any uh, uh, much image processing. Um, but uh, we will have images all along the uh, duration of the of the eclipse. And you can even compare with Pat's app to see <laughs> the difference. That's the other thing I, you know, I try to get, I try to figure out the spatial, which way is the sun gonna come from? Uh, you notice that in Pat's app, it kind of goes across like this. It, you know, it doesn't just go straight across. It does this kind of strange, um, strange angles and you can kind of see that happening and that's sort of an illusion and that has to do with how they're moving it, like the rising and setting and like the kind of slightly different motions of them like I mean it is going straight in front but because of the way that they're rising and setting it gives that funny illusion that it's like making this swerve Wait, the first time is... we saw that we were like what, what is, is it happening but if you look at them individually, it makes sense. Awesome. Um, so I wanna just give you a quick demo with just a few of those 
uh, images from October, which I have put in a Google Drive for you. And Erica uh, and Jesse can share that later. So you could practice this yourself um, around uh, uh, creating an animation. So if you, again, go back to that micro observatory homepage and go to the JS9 image application, um, uh, for those of you who haven't used it before, and I think most the the people on here uh, have used it before, there there's a tutorial that can take you through um, how to how to use the tool. But for I'm just going to quickly uh, drag and drop a, a few eclipse images in, and I will bring my little folder of eclipse images. And again, I've put these on a Google Drive for you. I'm going to close the image that's um, uh, uh, de by default open. And I'm going to take eight Eclipse images and drag and drop them into JS9. And if you watch closely, you'll see as they load, you'll see something happen. OK, so they loaded, and there's a series, and they kind of animated themselves as they loaded. So there's really just. There's three tools that you need to know how to use in JS9 in order to create that nice animation that I showed you at the beginning. And those three tools are, um, and actually uh, those are uh, blinking, blending, and shifting. Because you notice the sun, the telescope wasn't always pointed in the same place. So you want to shift the images so that they all align. The blend tool is allows you to see one image compared to the next so that you can do that shift. And then the blink tool is what you use to animate. So those are the, those are the three tools you need. And um, there's actually, I realize where time is short, so I want to mention that we have a tutorial on doing just this, blinking, blending, um, and shifting to create an animation. And that tutorial is from a lunar eclipse that uh, happened a while ago. And I think I have that. Where is that? Yes. OK, I'm going to put that in the chat. And one question for you folks is, should we be making a similar tool for this, for this solar eclipse? Um, if I can find the chat, I will put it in there. Oh, maybe I won't. I can't find the chat while I'm sharing with you. Never mind. I'll put it in later. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, again, you want the blend tool. You want the blink tool. And you want the shift tool. And so I have... Um, these tools have lists of the all the images that you open. And if I um, just blink the first two and hit blink, it just blinks between those first two images. If I stop that and do the first and the last image, okay, I start to have an animation here. Um, and you notice that as the moon covers up more of the sun, the sun actually gets a little dimmer if you don't enhance the brightness here. There's less light coming from this thing. So in order to have your animation look best, you want to do some enhancement um, to, get, to get an even brightness. So there's lots of kind of tips and tricks. It's actually a big challenge to make an animation, but it's very satisfying uh, to do with uh, observations on your own. Um, so uh, that's the blinking is for animating. I'll stop the blinking and I'll highlight those same two images for the blending and align them. So I'm going to unclick all the ones in between the first and the last. And I'm going to hit blend. So now you see, OK, they aren't aligned. And so I'm going to use the shift tool to, uh, I think I'm going to use the shift tool here. Mm. 
Oh, I'm on the wrong. I'm shifting one that's not in the view. There we go. That's what's happening. Okay, so now I'm shifting to the left, then I'll shift that down. You can see, I think you can see I'm clicking this down. That one image is, so I'm aligning the sun with the sun, not the moon with the moon. Although I wonder what would happen if I aligned the moon with the moon. This is very interesting. I'm interested in that animation. I'm going to have to try it. So now I'll go back and do that blink now that I've aligned them. Oops, I have to unblend them. Sorry about that. Because now you're there. So now we'll see one at a time, unblended. And now that I've uh, shifted them so they're aligned, it's much better. So that's my resource for you to make your own animation of a lunar eclipse. We can send you um, uh, information about that. And again, there is this, um, this lunar eclipse instance of the JS9 tool that actually um, takes you through a tutorial of the using that little guided tour with a series of moon images on a lunar eclipse. And it tells you just what to do there's some a guided tutorial and then a movie about using that blink blend and shift tool. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, I would love to leave open the floor for questions for any of our guests. Um, or if you and Pat also have questions for the community, that would be great too. I actually do, it, you know, what would be useful to, it, um, I mean, I've created a, I, a, a place for you to access all the October images um, and the April images will be in the directory for 30 days, but then they'll disappear. So we could make a special, I mean, if it's useful, we could make a special, um, place for them. I think those would get used if you made a special place for the total eclipse. Yeah, I mean, I could do it in the same, I, okay. Especially if we end up sending Frank to the path of totality and we get microobservatory images with the corona showing. I just put something in the chat. Um, I our museum is a member of the outreach for the upcoming punch mission, mm, and nice. uh, there's some solar activities that they've come up with that we've come up with. Um, all, most of them don't actually have much to do with eclipses, but there is one that does, and it's a pinhole projector activity, um, which is the bottom link in that chat that I just put in there. Um, if anybody wants. Some of those pinhole projectors, we've got well, like 25,000 or something of them left in around here. So I will be happy to throw some in a box or an envelope for you. So if you uh, if you want some, let me know. Very kind of you to offer. I'd love to get rid of them. They're taking up a lot of room in our break room. I want to get those boxes out of there. <laughs> Other questions or comments? There's some really giant last into the eclipse too, because I mean, the as I said, the one from the other day, which has gone around the side, I think you could see just with your eclipse glasses, you don't need a telescope. Yeah, I was told it's a 27 day rotation. So if they're still there, they'll come back in 27 days. But I don't know what time scale they they Yeah, have. they usually grow and fade over a week or two. Mm -hmm. Another 
comments or things about eclipse planning in general? Yeah, what are what are what are you doing, Jim? And I, I guess we lost Dave, but so I'm I'm going to an event. So whenever the annular eclipse was here, you know, it went directly over Albuquerque. And I helped uh, NOAA with an event that they did at the Balloon uh, Fiesta. And so they've asked me to help with an event that they've got planned in Dallas at the Cotton Bowl. So they expect like 40,000 people to come there. So it's going to be exciting to see what happens. Hopefully I can get rid of some of those pinhole projectors there. But um, I'm going to tell you, have you all heard of a Sea Star telescope? They're little automated telescopes. Um, so, yeah. um, so we bought one and I'm going to take it there and I'm going to try to uh, broadcast images of the eclipse back here to the museum. Um, and we're going to give away, you know, we, some of the punch activity, punch mission um, observing tools. Like we've got some solar, we don't have nearly as many solar glasses and viewers as we do have uh, pinhole projectors, but we're going to give away some of those. And um, uh, Patty Seaton and I will be doing a talk during the program. Um, and I think it's going to be broadcast on Noah's website. Oh. Cool. I was trying to get David to join us there, but I couldn't find him a place to stay. <laughs> wow. That's a challenge. Jesse, do you have any questions? You always have some great questions. I don't this time. I'm just very excited for the eclipse. And I really liked the the way that the the engagements that we were shown today, how you can keep exploring them, even if you're not in the path of totality, there's ways to connect with the eclipse and explore it and make it sort of feel like it's happening in real time with you, even if you're not in that that linear pathway, for example. So that was that was really neat. And I'm going to definitely explore it on my own after this too. So, and I'm thinking of institutions and who would really benefit from this. Cause we were, we were talking about eclipses and how to keep the momentum going for the science of eclipses. And just after the initial day of when the sun goes through the eclipse and then it's over, the science of it still goes on. And so, you know, I like how some of this these apps can sort of do that integration and exploration. So no questions, but I'm very happy. <laughs> well, it does make me think of the activity we've contemplated up here, right? Of doing the comparison from either side, Mary, of of the totality. Right. There, um, so you're supposed to be able to make an estimation of the size of the moon and the distance to the sun or what it wait which is it this so the the activity that we were going to write up um, yeah is um based on the parallax being uh, right able to find the distance to the moon and roughly how that works. Oh, and I did figure out why my thing was not working as I expected before. It's because I forgot to click this button. So, you know, here you're tracking the sun and here you're not tracking the sun. So you can just watch them kind of rise over the horizon. Um, but um, to do that parallax activity, if you're in the path of totality, then you know, basically what the position of the moon is relative to the sun. And then if you go somewhere that is off of totality, then you can see that there's like this angle shift and that angle shift is basically the parallax. So if you figure out kind of what this angle is, so like this is like half a degree so that's maybe, oh, I don't know. I don't like know, a tenth, tenth of a degree, of a maybe. A degree. Um, then there's an equation that you can plug this into to figure out the distance to the moon. And I haven't actually tried it yet, um, but that's on my list of things to write up as like an, an activity that you can do with this. Yeah, and I think that's a great way, as Jesse was talking about, extending after 
the eclipse, right? Like we all got really excited. We saw it. Now what? Oh, we can learn a little bit more about what we can do with, with that new knowledge and that new experience. All right. Well, we are closing in on our time for today. Thank you both so much for, for joining us and presenting to this group. We, uh, as always, we'll put this up online. We've been getting lots of great views after the fact for our cosmic conversations. So we'll be excited to share with our community. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank great. you. Good to see you all. Thanks.